So we are celebrating communion this morning where we set some time aside to remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. The Bible tells us countless times to remember the goodness of the Lord. And in our prayers, we should be praying for the Lord to forbid the day that we forget what God has done. So I wanted to read a familiar passage to you um, in Isaiah 53, starting in verse 3. It says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with the bitterest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way when he went by. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried, and in our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were punishment from God for his own sins. But he was wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten that we may have peace. He was whipped that we may be healed. All of us have strayed like sheep, and we have left. God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the guilt and sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. From prison and trial, they led him away to his death. But who among the people realized that he was dying for their sins, that he was suffering their punishment? He had done no wrong, and he never deceived anyone. Yet he was buried like a criminal, and he was put in a rich man's grave. And then, when I was a baby believer, I used to think to myself, why would Jesus subject himself to that? Like, why didn't he just leave us to our own devices? And then in Titus chapter 3, I realized how much God loved us because it says, once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were misled by others and became slaves to many wicked desires and evil pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy. We hated each other and they hated, and we hated others and they hated us. But then God, our Savior, showed us his kindness and love. He saved us not because of the good things we did, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins and gave us a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out his spirit upon us because of what Jesus Christ, our Savior, did. He declared us not guilty because of his great kindness. And now we know that we will inherit eternal life. Praise God. Praise God that he knew from the foundations of the earth that we would be um, wayward children and he had a plan to restore us back to himself. So um, I need four elders to come forward, please. Help us communion. Heavy lifter. Thank you, Lord.
that's the thing that reminds us of the first. Where he says, For this is what the Lord himself said, and I pass it on to you just as I received it. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for ushering in the new covenant, which um, allows us to have our sins forgiven and that we are indwelled by your Holy Spirit. Father God, we just praise you, Lord, that you have made a way for us to be restored back to the Father. And um, Lord, we would be doomed and nothing without you. But because we've all made that one decision to trust you with our souls and to believe in the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us, we are recipients of a sweet salvation. We just thank you so much, Lord, for the assurance that you give us, for the guidance that you give us, for your Holy Spirit, for, for loving us, and for just pouring out blessings upon blessings upon us. We thank you, Lord God, that you will return and that you will set up your kingdom. And at that time, we get to surround your throne and we get to call you Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, and Prince of Peace. Thank you, Lord God, that you've included us um, in your plans that you have um, engraved our names into the palm of your hand and uphold us with your victorious right hand. So just praise you and thank you for calling us your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, kids, you want? I want to thank y'all while you're turning there. I want to thank y'all for your recent. I want to thank y'all while you're turning there. I want to thank y'all for your receptivity to last week's message. As we had a new generation here, a very hard topic to to talk about, um, or sensitive topic, I should say. And it was a message of exhortation. And the thing about exhortation is it feels like rebuke sometimes, right? Rebuke is when you're trying to correct something that is wrong. Uh, exhortation isn't necessarily that. It's encouraging to do the right, to do the right thing, right? So uh, it was a message of exhortation, very heavy, and uh, I just wanted to praise you guys. There are so many things that we as a church are, are doing that encourages me. As you look out, especially as the storm that came last week, Helene, I know many of you have been lending a hand to those who have been affected. I know that my Connect group has been involved in that with uh, just people that they know, and many of you, uh, Dan and Julie, of course, uh, with their work in Hudson, and some of y'all are working with them, I know. So it's been really encouraging to see our church just show the love of Christ through practically serving these people who have been affected. Uh, we might have to do it again here this is coming week, so just brace yourself for that. So anyway, I just wanted to thank you guys for that. I wanted to encourage you. Uh, so many of us are actually stepping forward into our community to those who need to f uh, just be practically shown what the love of Christ can look like. And uh, I know you guys are doing that, so I'm just thankful for that. All right, if you've turned with me to Jude, I want to go ahead and remind you of the context here, the things that we've been looking at. Jude, the, the brother of Jesus, 
right? He's one of Jesus' brothers. He came to, it doesn't seem like he followed Jesus during Jesus' lifetime, but afterwards uh, became a, a church leader, accepted Christ, became a church leader. And he's writing this book, and if you recall, it's interesting. He writes, he sits down to write with one intention in mind, and as he's writing, a different subject matter comes across. And so he's encouraging us to contend for the faith, he writes. And why do we need to contend for the faith? Why do we need to do this? It, picture it like a, a football game. There's two teams, and one team is already on the field. One team is already on the field. This is these false teachers who have crept in unnoticed. They're already on the field. They're already active in the game. And so Jude is saying, hey, uh, you need to take the field as the other side here. You need to contend for the faith. There's one side already actively at work. We need to make sure that uh, our side is actively at work as well. So we've looked at a couple of things. We've looked at the what. What is this book about? It's about contending for the faith. He says that right at the beginning. So what is it about? Why is he saying this? He's saying because there's already false teachers out there. They've already crept in. But one thing we haven't looked at is how. Did you notice that? We haven't looked at the how. Sometimes we forget about the how. We just assume that we know the how. Uh, we don't need to even be told how because we already know how to contend. Uh, in reality, we need to be told how to contend. And so we're going to look at that this morning. If you've noticed as we've gone through this book, as he's gone through all these different uh, stories to prove his point, all these different things, there haven't been, you can fact check me, I don't think there's been any commands up until this point. Uh, I might be wrong there, but it's, if, as I've gone through here, I didn't see any commands up to this point. But as we get started here in verse 17, we're going to see three commands, three imperatives, three I'm telling you what to do. And he's going to have three th things for us here and so you'll see these as we go through, and this is the how of this book. How, we, how are we going to do this? Let's go ahead and just read verse 17 through the end of the book, and then we'll go back through verse by verse. He says, But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, In the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And dear Lord, we ask you to teach us your word this morning. Uh, we thank you for this book that you gave us through uh, Jude. Thank you for preserving it, giving it to us, all the way down into our time 2,000 years later. Uh, we can pick this up and read it and understand it. Um, but Father, we ask that you're, uh, through your Holy Spirit, you'd be teaching us what it is uh, that we need to understand about this passage and how we can use it in our daily lives. So we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the very first imperative, the very first command is right here in verse 17. He says, but you must remember. You must remember. Uh, if you can recall, what we've talked about in the previous messages is that these people crept in unnoticed. And so uh, there's a stealth operation in, in work, in effect. And it says, you know, you've got to remember the predictions of the apostles. Now, not everyone is an apostle. There was only a select few people who were apostles. These were people who walked with Jesus, who knew Jesus, and had been sent out by Jesus, a select group of individuals. Uh, so there's a limited number here. Which one of the apostles prophesied this? I think it's very safe to say biblically that it was Peter. If you remember, we were talking about how 2 Peter 2 is a companion passage to this, but 2 Peter 2.1 uh, very specifically says what Jude is saying here. Uh, it says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, 
who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying uh, the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And so when Peter is talking, he's using the future tense. He's saying will. This will happen. And uh, when you're talking about the future tense there, that, that's a prophecy. He's talking about the future. He's saying there will be false teachers among you. And Jude is saying, remember how the apostles predicted that this would be so. And so he's quoting Peter here, uh, Peter the apostle. And it's interesting in the time that it transpired, Peter's prophesying as if it's a future thing. Now Jude is saying, yeah, it's a present thing. And we're 2,000 years later. It's still a present thing. Uh, this is something that is taking place. It was expected. And it's going to be here. This problem is going to be here until Jesus comes back. This isn't a problem that's going away. It's going to be present uh, among us. There are going to be people who bring in these destructive heresies and deny Jesus our, our, as our master. And so it's not going away. And so if you want to avoid being led off of course, remember the wandering stars we talked about in the previous message, but if you, don't, if you want to be, avoid being uh, led off course, you have got to keep it in mind that it is a, po uh, it is a potential reality that there's going to be someone standing in front of you claiming the word of God, claiming the authority of God's word, and they're not actually representing God's word. They're not actually representing the person of Jesus Christ. They're actually denying him as master. And so if you don't remember it, you're not going to be aware. You're not going to be paying attention. You're not going to have any sort of thought that, hey, I need to be a little bit careful here. So that's why he tells us one of the first things you've got to do if you're going to be on the contending for the faith team, you've got to remember that there is uh, this false teaching that is going to be present in the church. And so this is a good reminder, reminder that uh, we have to scrutinize. We have to scrutinize the things that we hear. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's somebody on TV or the person standing in front of you right now. I'm also subject to this scrutiny. Uh, you've got to scrutinize what you hear. So you can check a couple of things when you're scrutinizing a teacher. Uh, one, you can check the teaching itself. Are they actually basing their teaching off of what God's Word says? Or is it their own idea and they're finding verses that support that idea? Because uh, you can support anything if you want to take things out of context. Even uh, the devil himself will quote Scripture if he's trying to prove his point, right? And that does not make it biblical teaching. It does not make the devil's teaching biblical just because he quoted a verse. No, he is trying to use it to his own ways, and a, a human teacher can do that as well. Start off with their idea in mind. It's not God's idea. It's not God's way, but finding things that would support it. Uh, so you've got to scrutinize that. Which, which way is it? Is it coming from the Word of God, or is he using the Word of God to prove his own point? Uh, you can also check a person's life. Um, if, if a person is walking contrary, um, it, it's a pretty good indication. It's not necessarily a foolproof way, but it's a very good indicator, a strong indication. Man, they're, they're not actually, they don't have this relationship with Christ that they're preaching about because their lifestyle is contrary to it. Uh, so definitely need to keep that, those couple of things in mind as you're remembering, as you're scrutinizing teaching in front of you. Uh, check the word itself. Be a Berean, if you guys remember uh, in Acts. And also check the, check the life. And it says, it, that's what we've been talking about in Jude up to this point, right? He's been talking about all these things that they're doing. Yeah, you can check, check the life of a teacher to see, man, is this somebody I should be listening to? Because it's not really making an impact in their life. Right? So number one, you must remember. That's the first thing that we're looking at here. You want to uh, contend for the faith, be a part of that team, you definitely need to remember. Otherwise, if you don't remember, you're going to be uh, taken uh, over to the other side, <laughs> you're going to be taken on advantage of by the false teachers. Number two, um, keep yourself in the love of God. There's actually a few verbs here, and they're ing, if you see that, ing, supporting. The main verb here, the command, is keep yourselves in the love of God. Let me go ahead and read that, uh, starting in verse 20. 20 and 21 we'll read. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And so, yeah, keep yourself in the love of God, he says. And that is a command. Keep yourself in the love of God. Now, for some of us, that might sound a little bit uncomfortable. We don't know what that means. Keep yourself in the love of God. What does that mean? Does that mean that I can lose God's love? Does that mean that God will stop loving me? Does that mean that uh, I can take myself and be 
yeah, I have God's love today, and then I do something wrong, and now I don't have God's love tomorrow. Uh, no, that's not what this is teaching, although some leaders would teach that. For some Christian leaders, they use a fear-based motivation for their congregation. They like to scare the congregation into behaving, and so they'll dangle that in front of people, say, hey, you don't want to lose God's love. You better shape up. You better shape up. Uh, no, that's not biblical. What does the Bible say about God's love? Well, it says, for one, that God is love, 1 John 4, 17. God is love. That is his nature. He is a loving, loving God. Um, I think you could say God is always loving people would be a good way to say what that means. And it also says in Romans 8, 31, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Right? So if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've believed in him, the Bible says that you've been placed in Christ. He's taken you from the realm of darkness. He's transferred you, baptized you into the body of Jesus Christ. You are now in Jesus Christ. And if you're in Jesus Christ, nothing can separate you from God's love. That is in Christ Jesus. So that's not going to happen. We're not going to lose that love of God. It's not possible to lose God's love, but it is possible to not abide in God's love. It is possible to not abide in God's love. That's what's in view here. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. So this is clearly something that we do, right? Because he's telling us what to do. So it's clearly something that we do. But it's talking about abiding in God's love. This is actually part of a larger teaching in the New Testament called abiding in Christ. But John 15, 9, this is something that Jesus said as well. This isn't just Jude saying this. Jesus himself said this to his disciples. He said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. You see what he's saying? I do love you. I do love you. I have loved you. And then he says, abide in my love. So Jesus is offering the love, but it is possible to abide or not abide in that love. That's an important distinction to make there. So you can say, man, I know that God loves me. I know that Jesus loves me. Um, but now, okay, there's this thing I need to do, which is abide in his love. Now, the next verse in John 15 actually says explicitly what that is. He says, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. But don't take that out of the broader context of John 15, because John 15, 4 starts off saying, abide in me and I in you. So you abide in his love as you're abiding in him, right? So he says, keeping my commandments is abiding in my love. Uh, but how do we do that? By first abiding in him. So abiding in Christ, that is the, that's the thing that we're talking about here, abiding in Christ. It's probably one of the most central truths to the Christian life that there is, learning how to abide in Christ. What does that mean? How do I do it? What happens if I don't do it? It's so central to everything in the Christian life. Once you have accepted Jesus Christ, learning to, on a daily basis, abide in Christ. So important. It's, so what is it? it it's, it's developing a spiritual awareness is what it is. A divide, uh, abiding in Christ, it's saying, man, um, I'm learning about my relationship with Jesus. I'm learning about what God's word says about my relationship with Jesus, and I'm taking it by faith on a daily basis. I'm not being moved out of that. So abiding, right? If we have this English word abode, you know what abode means, right? That's a very, uh, I don't know, not vernacular way to say our, our home, right? Where we live. It's a place that we stay. That's our abode. Same concept here with abide. It's a place that we remain. It's a place that we stay. It's a place that we don't leave. And so learning what my relationship with Jesus is based on his word, staying in that place on a daily basis and not getting pushed out of that, not going to somewhere else, not leaving that spot, abiding in that spot that he's placed us in. How important is it? Uh, I like what Andrew Murray, if you know the Andrew Murray, a writer from the 1800s, maybe. Um, he wrote this in his book, Abide, Abide in Christ. He says, the believer can each day be pleasing to God only in that which he does through the power of Christ dwelling in him. And that's really what, you're, what it's all about, learning this. When he says in John 15, if you know the broader passage there, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, I in you. He who abides in me bears much fruit. And so we're talking about bearing fruit here, right? Ob obedience to the commandments. If you love me, you'll, or if you abide in my love, you'll keep my commandments. So bearing that fruit 
that, where does that come from? It comes from abiding in the vine. The branch is abiding in the vine. We are sourcing our life, our spiritual life, from him on a daily basis. We're not looking to ourselves to produce that. We're not trying to consecrate the power of the flesh and through human effort and striving produce fruit that is pleasing to God. No, we can only be pleasing to God in so much as we're drawing that life from Jesus Christ, allowing him to live his life through us, allowing that sap from the vine to flow right into my branch and produce clusters of grapes there on the end. That is fruit that's pleasing to God. So abiding in his love, abiding in his love. It's, it's very much a mindset that we have to develop, okay? So not the power of positive thinking, right? Not just, uh, I, I want this to be so, and so I think it really hard, and so it is. No, it is understanding what the truth is and dwelling on that, allowing our minds to be mentally focused there. And so it's a mindset to develop over time. Romans 8, 5, and 6 talks to this as well, uh, about how this is a mindset. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So it's learning to set your mind on the spiritual truths. It's learning to set your mind to the things of the Spirit, not setting your mind to the things of the flesh. Um, so, man, there's so many ways that you can apply this in your own life. Um, <laughs> when someone is, is rude to you, right? What, is, what does the flesh say to do? <laughs> be rude right back, right? So simple. And not even like, I'll be like less rude than them. I'll just be passive aggressive, you know. <laughs> I'll say it. I'll know what I'm thinking. They might not pick up on the snark that I'm passing on. But I'm satisfying that desire of the flesh, right? Um, I just have this, this desire just to get a little zinger in there. And even if I'm the only one who notices it, I'm satisfied. Uh, I got it in. Uh, whereas Scripture would say, man, love those who hate you. Do good to those who revile you. Bless those who curse you. Uh, there's a whole different set of teachings there. And so as your man... Uh, I just got uh, slapped across the cheek here. I'm going to offer him the other also. That's setting your mind to the things of the Spirit. But then you realize, man, I actually don't have that within me. I do not have the desire to do that. I do not have the will to do that. I do not have the power to do that. And so you're going to God's Word and you're saying, man, this person that feels powerless and does not want to do this, that person actually was crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So now I'm taking this by faith. I'm saying, man, uh, in my experience, I, don't, I feel very much alive. I feel very much like the flesh is still alive in me. I feel like that snark wants to come out. I feel like that is alive. But the Bible actually teaches that my old man has been, die, has been crucified. He's died with Christ. I'm going to take that by faith. I'm going to take that by faith right now, and I'm going to abide in that truth. I'm going to stay in that truth. I'm not going to be shaken by my circumstances here into something else. I'm not going to be moved. I'm going to stay in the truth that I have died with Christ if I am in Christ Jesus. More than that, I'm going to take by faith that I am alive unto God through the power of the resurrection life living in me. So I don't feel like I have this power within me, but the Bible teaches that if I'm in Christ, I actually do have this power living in me through the power of Jesus Christ in me. So I'm actually going to take that by faith now in this situation. I'm going to step into this situation, I'm going to walk forward, and I'm going to trust that God is going to produce that fruit in me because I'm abiding in the vine. Man, um... But we don't like to do that. We like to allow our circumstances, our own thoughts, our own feelings to take us outside of that house that God has put us in, which is in Christ Jesus. We like to step outside of that. And when we do, there's no fruit to show for it. No fruit that's pleasing to God. Only as we are staying and abiding in Christ, drawing that life from him, allowing him to work through us in our daily circumstances, do we abide in Christ and when we abide in Christ, the natural byproduct is fruit that is pleasing to God. Um, yeah, so important. That's why I say it's so central to the, the teaching of the Christian life. It's so central, uh, this, this truth of abiding in Christ. A Mo lot more places in the scripture teach it more extensively. 
Uh, this is just a little thing here. Keep yourself in the love of God. But he elaborates even further, doesn't he, Jude? He has these other ing verbs that support this command, right? So the command is keep yourselves in the love of God, reminding us that this is something that we have to, uh, this is an, a spiritual awareness that we have to foster. We have to be mindful of this, allow ourselves to not be moved from where God has placed us. Uh, but what are some other things that he says here about this? Uh, it says, first, um, we have to build ourselves up in the faith, right? So he says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith. And so building yourself up in the most holy faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, right? So if you're going to build yourself up in the faith, you've got to be in the word. You have to be in God's word. And some of us aren't uh, aren't as able to abide in Christ simply because we don't know what the word says about it. This was me as a young, young believer, all zeal, no knowledge, right? And so I am trying my darndest to live my life for God, uh, but I'm doing it through the power of the flesh. And I'm doing this because I actually don't know what the Bible says about my relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know what it says about me and Jesus Christ. I don't realize that the Bible says I've been blessed with every spiritual gift in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, 4. I don't recognize that I am accepted in the beloved. I don't recognize that the Bible says I'm complete in him. Wow, I'm complete. I feel like I'm lacking. I'm always asking God for this, that, and the other. But he says you're complete in my son, Jesus Christ. Oh, man. So I'm not able to abide in Christ as a young believer because I simply don't know what the word says about my relationship with Jesus. So this underscores the, the need to be in the word, know what God's word says, particularly as pertains to this subject, but everything else as well. You want to build yourself up in the faith? Uh, you need to be in the word. That's why I'm really happy that our, our teenagers are doing a daily quiet time being challenged to do that in the word every single day. Some of the adults are doing it too. To support the teens, that's a good thing. That's awesome. If you want to do it, you still can. Um, yeah, I think Jude's making the case to speak, uh, be in the Word, okay, on a, on a regular basis. What else does it say here? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. I, I don't believe he's talking about a, a certain class of prayer, a certain category of prayer. Like some prayers are just like regular prayers, and then other prayers are prayers in the Holy Spirit. I don't think that's what he's saying here. Um, I think that what he's saying here is that this is just a regular uh, prayer, Ephesians 6.18, very similar wording to what it's talking about here. But uh, I think it's just a reminder that prayer is not a one-way street. Prayer is not a one-way street. Uh, yes, uh, many, many of us treat it like a one-way street, right? Uh, we just come to God with our couple of things that we need. Uh, God bless me and my wife, bless my son and his wife, and us four no more, amen, right? They ever pray with a prayer like that? It's just my needs a uh, couple other needs, and boom, I'm done. No, no, prayer, we need to be listening to what the Spirit is saying, right? Um, uh, he's, he's list, he, he knows, for, first of all, the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God, is what um, Romans 8 would teach. And uh, because he knows the mind of God, right, we don't always know how to pray. As we develop that, as we foster that, learning to listen to his voice, um, we can start to pray more in line with God's will as, as we grow in that. But yeah, we're, we're talking to God. He's also talking to us. We don't often hear it, though. We have to be, we have to be still. We have to be quiet. We have to be patient. Um, you know, you think of Daniel when he was praying for however many days and wasn't getting an answer. And, uh, and he just kept on his face. And then uh, eventually the, the angel shows up with the answer and says, listen, we... We were delayed. We didn't get here right away with the answer. But, uh, yeah, there are times that you have to be patient waiting to hear God's voice in prayer. But I think it's a two-way street. Uh, so praying in the Holy Spirit, uh, we're listening to the Holy Spirit. We're praying. Yeah, if you're doing that, if you're really communing with God in your, in your prayer life, talking to God in your prayer life, uh, yes, very much going to be helpful as you're abiding in Christ, as you're learning to abide in Christ. And third, what else does Jude say here? Um, so it says, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting, another ING, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And so, as Frank said in the announcements, Jesus is coming back, right? And we teach that that return can be at any moment. And 
this is such a better motivation for the Christian life than, than any fear-based tactic, any uh, guilt-based tactic that uh, leaders like to use. This is a tactic that God himself uses, reminding us that Jesus is coming back soon. And when he is coming back soon, see, if you actually believe that, if you actually believe that he could come back today, if you actually believe that he could come back at any point, then there's a refocusing, a shifting of your priorities, right? You still have to live life, right? We still have to eat. We still have to uh, clean up after our kids, right? We still have to go to work. That would be too extreme to stop all of those things. Life still goes on, but you are reprioritizing your life in light of the fact that we do not have much time left. Such an incredible uh, motivation. You're, you're understanding that everything that we see around us is temporary. Uh, James, I believe, it says it's a vapor. It's a mist. If you've ever seen steam coming off of uh, a lake, maybe in the winter around here, right? We had a cold morning and we might have steam, uh, smoke on the water, they call it. Uh, it's, it's just there and then poof, gone, right? Or it talks about a flower that fades. Have you ever seen a flower that blooms in the morning? By the afternoon, it's already wilting. Yeah, that's our life. That's our life. That's your 72 years here on earth. 74 if you're ladies, right? Um, you get a couple extra years. It's just here today, and it is gone. It is gone so fast. It's just a shadow of a greater reality that's to come. It's just a little foretaste of something so much bigger that's going to come in the future. It could come at any time. And when we have that present, when we have this expectation of his return on a daily basis, it really does re have a, a way of refocusing our attention, reshuffling our priorities. There's an urgency, and you've heard me mention urgency before. Urgency is not being frantic and running around, oh, no, oh, no. Urgency is what is actually important today that I do? What is actually something of eternal value? That's what I want to be about today. So you see these three things. We see building yourself up in the face. So being in the word is what I, I believe is a really practical way to apply that. How you build yourself in the, word, uh, in the faith? Be in the word. Praying in the Holy Spirit and waiting for Jesus Christ. If you're doing these three things, if you're in the word and you're talking to God and you're expecting him to come back, it is really hard for me to believe that you would be able to be blown off course by a false teacher. It's really hard for me to believe that that would be the case. Why? Because you're holding fast to Jesus. You're holding so fast to him in your daily life that, man, it's impossible for Jesus to get blown off course, right? He's not going to be blown off course. So if you're abiding in Christ, if you're in relationship with him, if you're doing everything, channeling everything through your relationship with him, it is really hard for you to get blown off course by these people who have snuck in, crept into the church unawares. Uh, you are going to be very, very solid in your growth as a Christian because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Running low on time. Oh, man. Verse 22, it says, And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Yeah. Number three, we've talked about, you must remember, keep yourselves in God's love. Number three, have mercy on those who doubt. I regularly, as you go through the New Testament, you're going to see two classes of people frequently talked about. You're going to see regular folk, and you're going to see false teachers. False teachers, man, they're, they're, it's pretty harsh what it says about false teachers. Uh, he tells Titus, Paul tells Titus to, uh, there's these false teachers who are upsetting whole families. They must be stopped. Rebuke them sharply, he says. Uh, but then there's another class of people who are regular folk. These are the um, not, they're not taking this position of spiritual authority. Um, man, it talks about being gentle. talks about being loving. talks about being merciful here. Um, a very, yeah, patient. There's no patient with the false teachers. They must be stopped. Someone else, man, who's wandering off course, man, a lot of patience, a lot of patience, a lot of mercy. Um, 
Yeah. Mercy is often lacking in the church. I'm not saying this church, but in general, mercy is often lacking. Um, somebody starts walking away, and uh, at times church members can be just gleeful watching them walk out. Uh, <laughs> One church that uh, used to support us when we were missionaries, uh, this guy stood up in a meeting and he said, well, I'm leaving. And then other people stood up and started clapping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mercy is often rare in the church. Um, but it's always necessary. Mercy is always necessary. Um, and he, what are the two classes of people here? What are two classes of people here that need to be shown mercy to? Well, it says the first we snatch out of the fire. The first it says we snatch out of the fire. And what does that mean? Uh, this could be people who are unbelievers on their way to uh, the place of fire, the lake of fire, if you will. Um, but fire in the New Testament can even refer to God's judgment a little bit more broadly. A believer uh, can, man, be disciplined by the Lord. Um, I'm not sure which it's talking about here. I'm not sure if this is talking about the fire of hell or just a broader sense of judgment. Either way, um, what it is in their life is leading them to a place where God is going to deal with it. And so you're snatching them out of the fire. And this almost communicates like an, uh, a swiftness, a running towards, right? This is, oh man, the fire is there. They're falling in. I have to act quickly to snatch them out of there. Um, yeah. That's one class of people. That's what we're doing. That's how we're showing them mercy. It says the second group, we show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. The translators are being a little bit queasy here. Uh, literally, this is undergarments. Okay? So just to say it literally, what it's saying here, the dirty underwear, that, uh, that might gross us out. That's the point. That is the point. It is trying to gross us out a little bit here, hating even the dirty underwear here. Uh, you can just imagine some dirty underwear. We don't want to get near that, right? Um, yeah. Jude is also probably referencing a little bit here of Old Testament law, uh, of clean, unclean, right? An unclean person would touch a garment, and now the garment is unclean. Now, if I'm a clean person and I touch the unclean garment, now I'm unclean, right? You don't want that to happen. There's a whole rigmarole to go through when you have become unclean to get yourself back clean and in uh, good graces with the camp. You don't want to accidentally touch one of those garments. Um, that's not how we operate in the New Testament. There's not we don't have to worry about these garments anymore, but the same idea, we are approaching this with caution. And I think that the Bible teaches that there are different levels of danger with certain people. Proverbs definitely talks about wise people, foolish people, and evil people, right? And so it says that you approach a wise man and reprove a wise man, he'll be wiser still, right? He'll love you. Reprove a fool, he's going to hate you, and you've actually got to introduce consequences here. A rod is for the back of fools, right? So we're introducing consequences. That's how a fool is going to respond. Uh, an evil person, man, they're actually out to harm you. So there's different levels of danger when you're interacting with people, when you're showing this mercy, and I think that's what he's saying here. There's some that we're moving towards very swiftly, uh, showing mercy or snatching them out of the fire, others mercy with fear. Uh, we're recognizing there's a little bit of a dangerous element here. I'm being a little bit more cautious in my approach. Um, so which is which? How will I know? I'm going to leave this with you. 1 Corinthians 1.30. Um, the thing with the law is it's a do this, don't do that. Um, wisdom isn't quite so much. And it says, because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What does it mean that Jesus became to us wisdom from God? I'm going to leave that with you guys to ponder as we go today. But I think that, man, we definitely need to be taking situations to the Lord. We can't prescribe it beforehand. Um, how do I interact with this person versus that person? Taking it to the Lord. Man, I see somebody that needs mercy. They are not walking with the Lord. I need to show them mercy God, what is this? <laughs> is this a snatching out of the fire situation? Is this a hating even the garment stained by the flesh danger situation? How do I approach this? And how do, how do I act now based on what the Lord is showing me? It's a case-by-case -case basis. It's applying wisdom. As we close up, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Yeah. He's able to keep you from stumbling here. He's able to keep you from stumbling. As you abide in Christ, as you hold fast to him, 
he's actually able to keep you from stumbling. You worried about stumbling in your life? Draw closer to Jesus. Abide in him. Abide in Christ. He's able to keep you from stumbling. We don't have to worry about the negative influences here and there and everywhere. Like, oh no, if I get too close, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get me. Uh, no. There are times that we move forward to dangerous people in mercy, showing them that mercy, but we do it as we abide in Christ. And if we, as we do that, as it's our connection to the vine, as we're allowing his life to flow through us, we actually don't have to worry about stumbling because he can keep us from stumbling as we abide in him. The solution is not to separate ourselves uh, from the thing that would make us stumble. It is to hold on even stronger to the source of our power to keep us from stumbling. And yeah, the closing of the letter there. Many We could preach a whole, probably a whole other sermon on glory, majesty, dominion, authority. Um, so go ahead and get comfortable. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm going to end it there. And uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, it's been fun to go walk through this letter of Jude. I hope it was helpful for you. Uh, I enjoyed it as well, preparing for it. But I'm sure there's a lot of ways that we can apply this in our lives. It's not going to be a, this is the only possible application. Uh, no, there's going to be lots of ways that it can be applied, a lot of ways that God can use it. Dear Lord, thank you for this uh, day. We thank you for your word. We ask it to sink down deep into our hearts. Father, uh, our minds are weak and forgetful of so many things. God, we forget even what happened yesterday. Uh, so, Father, we pray that you would help us with our recollection of the truths that are in the book of Jude. Help us as we apply them to our lives. Um, Father, we, we thank you that we don't have to wonder about the state of our relationship. Father, we know that the person who comes to you in faith, Father, you receive. Father, the, those who are in your Son, Father, have a, a standing with you that is unlike anything we can imagine. Father, that the God of the universe has called us his friends. Father, we're not your, your servants. We are your servants, but we're not just your servants, Father. We, you call us friends. And, God, that's such a, a privilege, and it's something that we don't deserve and we didn't earn, Father. It's all a free gift uh, from your Son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. And, uh, Father, when we are, get distracted in our minds, I pray that you would help us to remember that uh, we have to abide. We have to stay right where you've placed us in, in your son, Jesus Christ, and never 